Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's time for another Wednesdays for Revival. Uh, this one is number 160, and it's titled, What the Nominal is Missing. As you know, we've uh, recognized that our community is full of a number of nominal believers. Now, we want to be very careful. We're not saying that a nominal believer is not saved. We're saying that a nominal believer does not give credible evidence of being saved. Uh, this credible evidence is not based on what we think. It's based on what Jesus says. Jesus says that we'll be known by our fruits and just simply go to the fruit of the Spirit. Are we growing in all of those fruits and is it seen in our lives? Do we want to love God more and do we want to love to live the way he wants us to? Uh, those are the two uh, basic ways to measure this. The, the two great commandments, love God, love others, and then the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, it's very easy to say you have these things, uh, but it's quite another, and it will show itself in your life. That is, the Spirit will be evident in your life. So we, we pray for ourselves. Sometimes we wonder whether or not we're saved, the issue of assurance of salvation. But we also pray for the nominals around us, and it's so good to know that the gospel that saves someone is also the gospel that grows someone. So as we're trying to reach out to the nominal Christians, those who are not really committed to the local church or are, may be committed to a local church, but they're not getting fed a good gospel and they're trying real hard, doing the best they can, hoping for the best, but being frustrated. Well, we've got good news. The gospel that saves grows. And so we just give them the gospel. So this morning, we're going to talk about what the nominal is missing. And again, we're using this because we want to pray and ask God to help us reach them with the gospel and see them find the joy and the glory of Jesus in their lives. So, the nominal's plight. The nominal Christian is someone who professes love for Jesus, but more or less lives like they are still in love with this world. They may be involved with church activities, yet their hearts are in it not for God's glory, but for their own comfort. Not having a secure grip on Jesus, the nominal Christian needs to be involved in religious activities that will quiet the nagging in their heart that they're still in trouble with God. Imagine how difficult such a faith must be. The nominal Christian hears the right words and says, I believe. Yet they function merely mechanistically, as if they got to do their part in order for Jesus to show up and do his part in their hearts. Yet Jesus doesn't show up. He doesn't change their hearts. They still feel the accusing grip of their guilty consciences. They still feel the insatiable hunger of their fleshly desires. They still feel the relentless passion to pursue pleasures that they know God sends people to hell for. And they live in a deep, every part of their being fear that they're lying to themselves, their families, their churches, and to God himself. Professing to be godly, their lusts shout at them, Hypocrite! They no longer worry about jolly old Santa watching them to see if they've been bad or good. Instead, they know God is watching them, and he sees it all, even the deepest, darkest desires they don't want to admit to themselves. Forget about assurance of salvation. The nominal Christian futilely fights to be free of the conviction that they're still doomed to a Christless eternity. I had only heard about you, but now I have seen you with my eyes. I take back everything I said, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. It's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. These wonderful professions of repentance from Job and Isaiah sadly may be on the lips of nominals who have never come to know Jesus when they see him on the day of judgment. That's not good. This is the nominal's plight, in other words. They still think They've done what is necessary to make all things right with God, yet they still feel dirty in his sight. They still sense God holds them guilty. If their faith in Jesus is not enough and they think they've done all they can, what hope is there? The nominal's pain. The nominal Christian's pain is often a consequence of not having received the spiritual doctrine the Spirit uses to cure what ails them. They've suffered under the doctoring ministry of pastors who diagnose their problems as temporary illnesses, things that can be cured with just a little effort here and there. They prescribe the medicine of meaningless words that the nominal Christian needs to declare with just the right amount of sincere, convictional belief. 
Yet the poor nominal doesn't even know what sincere or conviction or belief actually means, let alone how to find it in their hearts. The nominal's pain is exacerbated because they're still trying to cooperate with God, take their medicine and get better. Meanwhile, they're using a heart that is not ill, but dead. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. You are dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature that is not yet cut away. That's Revelation 3 combined with Colossians 2. Only those who are alive to God can please Him, the Bible says. Only those who are in right relationship with Him have a peace with God that surpasses all human ability to understand, let alone create, Paul teaches in Philippians. This is the fullness, then, of the pain the nominal Christian strives so desperately to mask. They're still in their sins. They're still in their guilt. They're still under God's condemnation as long as they live with their dead hearts. The nominal's promise. This state of disastrous affairs is not new to this generation. The church has always been filled with those whose faith is merely on their lips and has not penetrated their hearts. You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Matthew 15. The Jesus who is coming again to judge is staying away right now because his promise to fix what ails the nominal Christian is still available in the church. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. So in these verses, this is the wonder of the four-part promise of the gospel. First, in Jesus, God gives us a new heart cleansed from guilt, which keeps us enslaved to sin through death. This, is, in other words, is the twofold promise of justification. God removes our dead heart with all of its burden and rebellion against God by making Jesus liable for it. He also, in justification, grants us the righteousness with God that Jesus earned through his perfect, from first thought to last breath, obedience. Second, in Jesus, God gives us a new heart that makes us his very own. This is the promise of adoption. Through the spirit of adoption, our rightly fearful heart is removed, and a new heart that rightly recognizes God as our loving Father is given to us. Third, in Jesus, God gives us a new heart that loves him. This is the two-part promise of sanctification. God declares us holy in all our ways, and then day by day through the Spirit gives our new hearts transforming life, death to the loves of this world, and life to the love of God. And then the fourth part of the promise here in Ezekiel. In Jesus, God gives us a new heart that anticipates his glory. This is the promise of glorification. God gives us a faith-empowering assurance that the promise of the new heart will not be complete until we come into full possession of the perfection seen in the humanity of Jesus. I know that's a lot in very short summary. Each of these promises worthy of your examination because God uses the assurance of these things to fuel our faith and to grow us strong in Christ. But in sum here, the nominal Christian is missing the two vital parts of the gospel. They're missing the Bible's explanation of the reason for what ails them. They've got hearts that are dead toward their creator. They're also missing the Bible's full promise that through Jesus, their dead heart is excised and a new living heart, one that is alive unto God, is spiritually transplanted in. This is why we pray for revival, that the fullness of this gospel the promise then that fixes the problem might be given to the nominal Christian and that they might believe with a faith born of the Spirit in their new hearts. So let's pray here and then we'll move on. Dear Lord, all around us, even in some of us, we're professing a faith that looks and feels like it is in vain. Promised that those in Jesus are no longer a condemnation Many calling themselves Christians still live in guilt. 
promised freedom from slavery, the sin of slavery, many of us calling themselves your children still live under Satan's destructive rule. Oh God, see their plight, see our plight, see their pain, look on us in our pain, and then keep your promise to make all your children in the gospel free. O oh Lord, who hates sin and yet gives the covenant promises of grace and mercy, be gracious and merciful today and tomorrow. Save us and save the nominal Christians we know, and then save those who've never heard of your Son. O oh God, we're longing for your revival. Restore to us the years of locusts of Eden. Pour out your Spirit and revival on us. We ask for this because it's your promise to show your glory and your Father's glory and your Spirit's glory through us. So we long for this in your name. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. I pray that this blesses you and you take some time to pray. Remember, Wednesday mornings, lunch times, and dinner time, or Thursday mornings, you can pray with us. It's always good to pray with you, brothers and sisters. Thanks. God bless. Hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.